Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm here with Dr. Thomas Morgan. He is Assistant Professor at the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University. His background is in the evolution of animal social behavior and cognition. He's interested in the psychological mechanisms that support culture and evolutionary explanations for how humans came to be. So, Dr. Morgan, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Hey, Ricardo, no worries. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, great. So, today we're going to talk basically about, uh, or mostly about, cultural evolution. I've already had big names uh, of the field on the show, like Drs. Robert Boyd and Peter Richardson. So, uh, let me first ask you, because with them I talked about several different cognitive mechanisms that were the result, we think at least, of um, s uh, natural selection operating on human brains that give rise to culture or to our capacity to create and develop uh, culture and cultural systems. Uh, is it the case that we already have a complete account of those cognitive mechanisms? Uh, I mean, do we know all of them, even though we might not know exactly how they work? Or uh, are you still working on that? Um, I think we're a long way from having a complete picture of the psychology that kind of underlies culture. Um, and if, if anything, there's now more debate over the nature of those mechanisms. Um, so specifically, there's um, an increasing debate over whether we should think of um, the psychology behind culture as comprising specific cognitive abilities that have been favored by natural selection and have quite um, almost like a dedicated genetic underpinning, or if instead we should be thinking about things instead as uh, these mechanisms being the product of a more sort of general cognition, in which case some of the, the psychological adaptations that support culture, it's not, they've definitely evolved, but it's not necessarily a purely sort of genetic process. It might just be that a lot of these uh, cognitive abilities are constructed, uh, you know, are constructed over our development, so, you know, across childhood and adolescence, that sort of thing. And they're the product of maybe um, more widespread cognitive mechanisms like associative learning. Um, and if, if that's the case, then it's just a very different way to think about some of the psychology that underlies culture. But this is still an ongoing debate and there's, you know, a range of people on from the sort of the highly specific end to the highly general end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's basically the debate uh, about them being uh, domain-specific mechanisms or maybe the result of some domain general uh, learning abilities that we might have. Is it something like that? Yes, exactly. So um, one good example would probably be imitation, which is the ability to uh, acquire new actions by watching another individual performing them. Mm -hmm. And it's been argued that so humans are capable of this, but a lot of other animals are not, or if they are, it's only in a very sort of coarse fashion. Um, and so some people have argued that this suggests that imitation is underpinned by um, genetic change that is, you know, potentially unique to the to the human lineage. Um, and, you know, people have pointed to evidence in support of this with being the discovery of mirror neurons that are, um, appear in primates, but not, you know, not really outside of that group. And they presumably are highly... Uh, developed in humans, you know, mirror neurons appear to be this kind of neurological link uh, that bridges the gap between observing an action and then performing it yourself later. And the fact that we have these dedicated neurons has been cited as, you know, evidence that we've got this, like, evolved capacity for imitation. Um, but on the other side, you've got um, people who argue, you know, from a more domain general approach, who um, would argue instead that our ability for imitation is learned across um, childhood. And actually, so they would say, sure, we've got these mirror neurons, but where are they coming from? Um, is it that, you know, across childhood, as we're learning uh, how to imitate, that process is building these mirror neurons. 
And so it's not that they're being guided by like um, genetic changes necessarily that are specific to our lineage, but rather it's just you know part of the learning process um, that gives rise to them. And uh, probably you know among the people who really uh, support this point of view would be Celia Hayes, and she wrote a recent book arguing just this. And she even points to things like uh, mirrors, saying you know, the invention and now the widespread use of mirrors by human um, societies will support the learning of imitation across childhood, because now we can reliably, for instance, see our facial expressions or you know see what our behavior is like. And that's another way that we can refine our ability to imitate the actions of others. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's interesting and it's complicated. I've also had, uh, as you refer to her, Dr. Cecilia Hayes on the show recently and it's interesting because she has that approach that she calls um, the cultural evolutionary psychology, right? That, that is somewhat different from both evolutionary psychology and cultural evolutionary theory, particularly uh, in uh, contrasting it with evolutionary psychology, it seems that uh, most evolutionary psychologists have an approach where they think that the mind is basically uh, a huge number of domain-specific mechanisms that uh, have been the result of natural selection in a way or another. I'm not sure if they're all adaptations or not, or if some of them are byproducts or exaptations. I mean, that's very complicated. But anyway, is there, is there any well-established set of criteria that people use to decide if, um, if a particular mental mechanism is innate or acquired slash developed or something like that, or, or are there different approaches to it? So there, there is no uh, specific criteria, and ultimately it's, um, it's not a question that can be answered in a satisfying way, because ultimately the question is kind of malformed. Um, so even if we think about things that seem so um, that you know we're confident they're under quite strong genetic uh, influences in their development there's always going to be a developmental process and it's always possible to derail that process um, so for instance um, let's just think about you know arms humans very reliably have arms and it's you know it seems obvious to us that you don't really need to do any learning or, or practice to have arms um, but nonetheless it's possible uh, through exposure to like environmental toxins early on in development or you know potentially even through sort of extreme malnourishment when you're young you can disrupt delay or even sort of terminate the development of you know sort of typical human arms and so this, you know, this is an example of how even something that most people would see as like quite an innate part of our development is still a developmental process, and so there's still room for it to be shaped by environmental um, and you know, environmental influences. Um, uh, one of my favorite examples of um, sort of a, a weird hybrid of innateness but also learning is uh, the development of singing in zebra finches. So zebra finches are a small bird. I think they live in Africa. Uh, the males have what to me sounds like quite a bizarre song that they use to attract females. And um, it's it's very recognizable. It sounds quite a lot like sort of TV static and someone twiddling the dial on a radio. Um, but, you know, if you take a young male zebra finch from, or basically from an egg, and you know, hatch a male zebra finch and raise it in isolation, their song is... Um, sort of super bizarre and malformed and it's not typical of the species so that makes you think okay so they must be learning this song from each other you know the young zebra finches must be hearing the older males singing and they're copying that and that's where the song is coming from but uh, in a recent um, experiment some people at a, I believe it's a group at the University of Edinburgh they had these isolated males singing in isolation they recorded the sort of bad song of these males and played it back to them uh, and that alone, just hearing their own poor song, prompted them to produce almost you know, species-typical wild-type song. Um, so now it seems that actually, although this behavior does require some learning, uh, 
that it's not that they're copying the song of the adults. It just seems to be hearing anything that sounds a bit like Zebra Finch song just triggers the sort of the immediate spontaneous production of quite species typical song in in these birds. Um, so again, this is just a slightly awkward hybrid of a behavior that is both, you know, somewhat innate but also somewhat learned and while these kind of gray cases are fun to discuss, ultimately all aspects of our phenotype, whether behavioral or morphological, um, all of them fall somewhere on this spectrum where there's going to be genetic influences, even if they might be incredibly indirect, but there's also going to be developmental factors, even if they might seem kind of bizarre or strange. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let me just think for a little bit, because uh, the, uh, what is what do you think uh, or how do you think we should look at the relationship between biology and culture because it seems to me that sometimes when people talk about some examples of how culture might influence the way our cognitive mechanisms operate like for example there are instances where it seems that culture influences the way we perceive time there's that vast literature about the differences between individualistic versus collectivistic societies like for example the western ones versus the eastern asian ones um, so i mean but isn't it always the case that even if it were the case that it all derived from uh, domain general cognitive mechanisms that uh, we would we sh wouldn't have culture without biology and we would still have to know how our brains process information to understand how culture develops, that is, it would still be a culture via biology, let's put it that way, right? Yeah, okay, so that's quite a complex question, so I'm going to try and unpack it. So I think you're right that um, there is this debate over how should we understand culture um, alongside genetics, and it's typically the case that the, the, the um, take on the human brain, where you know where they are, the brain is composed of multiple discrete modules. They typically see those modules under relatively strong genetic influence. So the development of those modules is somewhat insensitive to the environment, and including in that environment is is culture. Um, and in that case, culture is more or less just the product of these modules, but it's not a it's not a causal factor in in their development or their evolution. Okay. So. In that model, if you understand genes, then you can kind of figure out culture anyway. And if you're interested in explaining the genes, then culture is not that relevant uh, because culture is, is you know quite downstream. Um, and that sort of uh, quite sort of gene centric approach is, like I said, often associated with um, a sort of a highly modular take on the brain. Um, at the end, and again, this count is the more um, the people who view the brain as more sort of open-ended um, and sort of based on domain general processes. In this case, um, behaviors and cognitive mechanisms are developing sort of off a more fluid substrate and there's more scope for uh, that developmental process to be influenced by environmental factors which we, you know, for sake of argument, we can include culture in that. Um, now, obviously, culture is both uh, is still the product of the brain. You know, it's the product of people making decisions, interacting with each other over multiple generations. But with this more sort of um, flexible domain general approach, there's room that once culture has been created, that it can go off and do somewhat independent things, and then so it's both evolving itself, so, you know, somewhat independently of genes. But then it can also change the environment in ways. Uh, that one pay, maybe you know not anticipated, and that can generate novel selection on the genes itself. Um, so I guess the way I think about it is that um, there are multiple ways that heritable information is passed down the generations, and these have changed and evolved over time as well. So you know, 
genetic information is transferred you know, by a reproduction. Um, I see cultural inheritance as just another form of that where it's not necessarily passed via reproduction, but rather it's you know, transmitted via observation, imitation, interactions, that sort of thing. And just because uh, cultural inheritance is built upon mechanisms that um, have genetic influence on them, it doesn't sort of make cultural inheritance redundant in terms of explaining human behavior. I guess we could make the same argument about genetic inheritance. So if we go far back enough in time, there was no genetic inheritance. There was a you know, sort of an earlier form of evolution that was underpinned by RNA and just maybe the you know, direct inheritance of proteins to a larger extent. And at some point in time, um, DNA evolved and steadily became you know, more and more important as a mechanism of inheritance. And you know, maybe at the time, I guess this is billions of years ago, maybe there were um, you know, evolutionary biologists then would have been saying, well, you know, this DNA, because it's all causally downstream of the earlier sort of RNA and protein-based inheritance systems, we don't really need to worry about it because it's ultimately, if we just know those systems, we can know everything we need to know about DNA. Um, and I think that's, that would be you know, the same kind of mistake that I think people can make with culture and genetic inheritance. Mm -hmm. So would you agree that there are two, two main ways by which culture might influence the way our brains operate? The first one would be if during the development of each individual, uh, by being exposed to cultural information, it changes the way our or some of our cognitive mechanisms work they, or it would be even possible for a culture to create uh, new cognitive mechanisms during our development that is during the lifetime of a particular individual but then we also have a phenomena of gene culture coevolution and that's when culture is part of the environment and works as a selective pressure on genes and influences a genetic evolution. And those are two different ways by which culture would influence the way our brains operate. Perhaps one of them would change uh, some aspects of our brains uh, definitely because it would have an impact directly on genes and the other one would be more developmental, let's say. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great way to think about it. So it might sound strange to suggest that you know we can construct a developmental environment that gives us wholly new cognitive abilities. Um, but I actually think there's great evidence that this, this does happen. So uh, I think a relatively clean cut case is um, the sort of counting and, and numeracy. So most languages, especially before the development of sort of long distance trade and agriculture, have um, quite sort of limited systems for, for counting. So you've got words that and then after that you just have words that mean kind of lots or, or many and you know for many instances that's all you really need I mean I've got a two and a half year old son now that is how he counts basically he kind of gets one and two but after that the other numbers just mean that there's lots of things um, but we know um, that um, societies that engage in things like lots of long distance trade and agriculture tend to have more elaborate counting systems, uh, you know, where you can count sort of indefinitely upwards uh, and you might have addition and division, multiplication, all that sort of stuff. And a lot of work has been, been done looking at how these systems uh, develop in, in the minds of, of children, because obviously this is an important part of education. You know, we want children to acquire these abilities. And one of the interesting things is that the there doesn't any sort of um, mechanism for children to acquire these abilities. It's not that there's some sort of um, evolved counting system. It's not even the the counting system that we develop uh, across our childhood is built on the sort of the more vague one to many system that's typical of like young children and some small scale human societies. 
Uh, instead, the evidence suggests that part of our working memory basically gets bootstrapped into uh, something that's capable of counting, even though it doesn't particularly come naturally to that system. So to me, this looks like a great case where um, culturally we changed our environments, engaging in lots of trade and farming, where we needed to keep track of accounts and, and things like that. You know, behaviors that really needed a sort of a, um, a number ability. And in the context of that environment, our brain responded plastically to try and produce one. And obviously it does so in a way that's not necessarily intuitive to contemporary you know, neurobiologists trying to figure out how the brain does the counting. It just finds a system that's kind of the closest thing. And developmentally, we kind of fudge it into a counting system. Um, mm. So to me, this is a really interesting and like I think I would say pretty well-researched example of how a cultural environment gives us a whole new cognitive ability that we didn't have before. And I'm sure you spoke to Celia about this when she was on your show, but she argues this applies to way more cognitive mechanisms than uh, I think many other scientists would even dare to suggest. So, for instance, she talks about how uh, theory of mind, the ability to understand the intentions of other people, um, that itself might be a purely sort of developmental phenomenon built out of much simpler domain general um, processes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we talked about that, about uh, imitation and theory of mind. We didn't cover all of the mechanisms that she talks about in her book because it would take really a long time to do yeah. that. But we covered those two and it's very interesting and the evidence is very convincing, mm -hmm. I would say. So uh, let's now shift gears a little bit and before we talk about other general topics, let's talk about uh, conformist transmission. That is one topic that you've been exploring in your work. Uh, and you tried to understand uh, what it was about, really. If it was about uh, copying a majority of individuals or a majority of instances where a, behavior, a particular behavior is performed, right? So. What could you tell us about that? What were the main conclusions you arrived at in your studies? Sure. So I guess a lot of my work um, kind of digs into detail in, into the mechanisms of cultural inheritance. Um, and so this is, a lot of the time, this is questions about how do we learn from each other? When do we do it? What does it look like when we're doing it? All this sort of stuff. And one mechanism or process by which we could learn from others that has got a lot of study is this conformist transmission idea. Mm -hmm. And when it started, it was more or less assumed. So the some of the foundational theory, mathematical theory, was done by Rob Boyd and Pete Richardson. Right. And uh, they more or less assumed that they defined it in terms of copying the majority of individuals. So they imagined a world where people had to acquire either belief A or belief B, um, and everyone around them had already made up their mind, basically. Uh, so a certain percentage of the population were A believers and the other percentage were B believers. And so what do you do as a naive observer? And they define conformist transmission as this idea that you would adopt the majority position, uh, but with probability greater than the current size of the majority. So let's say 70% of the people are A believers. Uh, then the current size of the majority is 70%. And so as long as you choose option A with a probability greater than 70%, you're engaging in conformist transmission. Okay. And um, this sort of hypothetical approach to social learning has received a lot of attention, um, primarily, I would say, because it has a tendency to homogenize groups. Mm -hmm. So in this group where 70% of people are A believers, if people updated their beliefs you know, regularly using conformist transmission, when you came back later, everyone would be an A believer. Uh, because over time, as people increasingly shift to A, uh, it just spreads to the population. The population uh, um, and you can imagine a world where there's multiple different sub, um, and they all start off with different frequencies of A and B. And so if they all engage in conformist transmission, when you come back later, some groups will have converged on A and others will have converged on B. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we've got cultural variation between groups 
and it's it's stable indefinitely, basically, assuming that people just engage in conformist transmission. So people like this because it seems a very simple, straightforward, and you know, cognitively not very demanding way to produce stable cultural differences between groups. And obviously, you know, stable cultural differences between groups are a hallmark of human populations. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you know, I, some of my early research that I did was just trying to establish whether or not humans really do engage in something that looks like conformist transmission. Uh, but alongside that, other researchers who study um, animal behavior started looking for conformist transmission in animals. Um, so there's, you know, work in primates, work in fishes, work in birds. It's become like quite a popular thing, you know, popular question of study. Because, you know, the question is, maybe animals can have, you know, stable cultural differences between groups as well. Right. And um, one of the difficulties, though, if you're going to study wild animal populations, is it's really hard just to, like, you know, collect data. You're out there in the field all the time. The animals aren't necessarily cooperative. Uh, it's hard to know who knows who or, you know, whatever. And also, unlike the sort of abstract mathematical theory, in the real world, people aren't just A believers or B believers. Maybe they kind of switch between them in a kind of chaotic and noisy fashion. Um, and so because of those real world difficulties, um, in quite a lot of the experimental animal behavior literature, they sort of adopted this other approach to conformist transmission, which is not defining the majority in terms of the number of individuals who express a particular belief or behavior. They shifted to a more sort of pragmatic thing, which is just the number of instances that someone has ob observed the behavior taking place. So now it's the case that, <clears throat> you know, I'm the observer, I look around me, how many times do I see behavior A being performed? How many times do I see behavior B being performed? I don't really care who's performing them uh, or how many times, you know, I don't worry that if all the behavior A's that I saw performed was just one person doing it again and again and again, it doesn't matter. I just add them all up and I copy the majority of instances. Um, and so the... The work, some work I did on this, which is what you were asking about at the start of the, the question, um, was I went back to the mathematical theory and I sort of expanded it to say, well, does it matter if people are using notions of the majority defined in terms of instances or individuals? Um, and it turns out it does, basically. Um, if there's any propensity for one behavior to be performed or observed more regularly or reliably than the other, then this can distort, um, or at least it generates differences between uh, your estimate of the majority, depending on whether you attend to the individuals, if you're counting up individuals, or if you're just counting up instances that the behavior is observed. Um, and because we know conformist transmission has this tendency to drive groups towards total homogenization, there's then a corresponding um, sort of... Uh, there's a possibility that depending on whether the observers count instances or whether they count individuals, different behaviors can be driven to fixation. Um, and the maths even suggested, which we weren't expecting, that you can imagine there's two observers. One of them counts instances and the other one counts individuals. And they both see the same population. Um, there's even a possibility that they might agree over which behavior is in the majority but because they might disagree over the relative size of the majority, that in the long run, depending on which kind of conformist transmission the population engages in, different behaviors can spread uh, to fixation. So, I mean, ultimately, this is basically just um, the goal of this work was to clarify this issue in the field because there's been some back and forth about it, just to say that it does actually matter from a theoretical standpoint. If you want to understand the long-term cultural evolutionary dynamics, we just want to think about uh, whether we're counting individuals or instances, and we can't treat them as totally interchangeable, uh, especially if we're interested in long-term cultural dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we're talking about uh, conformist transmission, does it matter if it is about social or asocial information? I mean, if, if you try to, to transmit information that uh, is about some sort of social issue or, for example, a piece of knowledge that is asocial in its nature? I mean, uh, 
does uh, does it make any difference in how people conform or uh, how people pay attention to which kind of information? Yes, yeah, so we still don't really know a lot about that either. So again, you know, the foundational theory just kind of strips all the complexities out of it and just talks about abstract, you know, beliefs or behaviors, A and B or, you know, whatever. Um, in the real world, things are always going to be a lot more complicated. Um, so you're right that we might expect people to behave differently when uh, they're acquiring different kinds of information. Um, example of this, in so in the fish literature, looking at copying or social learning in fishes, uh, this distinction, which I think ultimately came from economics, was made between um, just regular sort of social information and public information. So let's say I'm a fish and I need to decide which of two feeding patches is richer. Um, an example of social information would be that, you know, I just look to see where the other fishes are going and that, you know, I kind of see that as their like vote for which one they think is better. But there's you know, another kind of information is that if I watch the fish when they get to the feeding patches, I can literally watch their feeding behavior. And if they're feeding a lot, then that is you know, quite strong evidence that that feeding patch is rich with food. And so this kind of information is called public information. Uh, I think the idea is that you know, by a fish going to a feeding patch, feeding there, they make some information just immediately available to the public to, to see and that they can't hide this information, right? So in this case, you know, you could imagine a fish might lie in the case of the social information by swimming to a patch they know is poor uh, in order to lure other fish there, then they'll go to the better one later. But the thing is, public information uh, is almost impossible to lie about uh, because you're literally watching uh, their behavior that has a direct correlation with some feature of the environment that you want to learn about. Um, and so in that case, people have studied, you know, sort of differential sensitivity to these kinds of information in fishes, and lo and behold, the fish pay attention to the public information, so sort of rates of feeding, much more than they do the social information, which is just, you know, where have the fish gone, that sort of thing. Um, and it's, it's also the case that, you know, so conformist transmission is one suggestion from formal theory about how you might use information to make effective decisions, uh, there's a ton of different suggested you know, ways you can use social information and there's nothing stopping people from kind of using them all simultaneously to make one sort of more you know, richer and more complicated decision. And that's almost certainly what's going on in the real world you know, when people or fishes or, you know, or birds are making decisions is they're taking a whole bunch of different things into account, weighting them all, combining them, and then that is what's driving their ultimate behavior. So whenever we do theory, or if we do an experiment looking at a, a particular aspect of these decisions being made, a particular aspect of cultural inheritance, we're just taking a slice through the process, looking at you know one dimension of it, and generally we're not really saying anything about the other dimensions in that work. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, and in an article that you published in 2016 that has also something to do with uh, conformist transmission titled Sex Differences in Confidence Influence Patterns of Conformity. Uh, at a certain point there you state that lack of confidence in one's own ability can increase the likelihood of relying on social information. So th this is another aspect that we have to take into account and in this particular case since we're talking about sex differences i mean people could be a bit sexist and say oh it's just that uh, women are more conformist than men but then there's more depth into it when we look into the details because it seems that uh, it has, at least to a certain extent, to do with levels of confidence and each specific individual uh, lack or, of confidence or if he's confident or not. And then uh, if people are less confident, they tend to rely more on social information. Is that the case? Yeah, absolutely. So that was work I did with... Um Kind of a long-time collaborator, Dr. Kate Cross at the University of St. Andrews. And um, so that in parallel to the sort of cultural evolutionary approach to social learning, there's been an even longer history of studying social learning in social psychology, often called conformity. 
which is, I guess, not to be confused with conformist transmission. Um, and there, it's been like, it's, it's been, you know, observed for a long time that women tend to be more sensitive to social information than men. Um, and this is in social psychology, they tend to study it within sort of uh, ash like experimental paradigms where. Uh, you know, someone's asked to make a decision, but everyone around them is giving what appears to be just a, like a, a obviously incorrect belief. And you're looking to see that, well, will the person switch to side with the group, even though it's obviously wrong? Um, so they're using these slightly unusual uh, paradigms, you might say, um, that we wouldn't expect cases like that to arise in like the real world that often. But anyway, in these experiments, a common finding is that women tend to be more influenced than men. Um, in parallel to this, uh, so within the cultural evolutionary approach, another proposed sort of bias in learning is to copy others when you yourself are uncertain. Um, so, you know, say you've, you've attempted to collect some information to solve a problem. The information isn't really uh, diagnostic, so you're not sure what the best thing to do is. In that case, you, you know, uh, theory and evolutionary um, analyses suggests that it's a good idea to actually go off now and seek the opinions of other people because otherwise you're basically just guessing. Um, and again, there's data consistent with that. So I collected data from people, but there's data from a wide range of animal species as well. So this appears to be a very widespread bias that if animals are sort of denied sufficient information to make a decision on their own, they'll be highly sensitive to the decisions of what other members of their group or species do. Um, so in that, combine the two by saying, well, you know, what's, so there is this pattern of, um, higher social information use in, in women than in men, in humans, but you know, why is it? Because um, from a cultural evolutionary point of view, we expect social learning behaviors to have some sort of like function. You know, they, the whole idea is that our ability to learn socially evolved because it brings fitness benefits. So you know, why, what's the, you know, the evolutionary explanation for this difference between men and women? And so in this study, we dug into it a little bit more. We um, use tasks that are stereotypically associated to favor men or to favor women. And we asked people to like try and solve them themselves, ask them how confident they felt, and then told them what their group's mates thought, and then gave them another, you know, an opportunity to revise their decision. And uh, ultimately what we found was that yes, women do more um, than men, but it appears to be entirely mediated by their uh, confidence. So women express lower confidence in their own abilities. Um, and even more interestingly, this wasn't this different in confidence wasn't actually reflected in their performance at the tasks. Um, so rather, it's not that um, women aren't very good at some tasks. So this is reflected in their lower confidence, and so they copy other people more. It's actually that. Um, I guess you could say that women are underestimating their ability or men are overestimating their ability. And obviously this is men and women as a group, you know, individual men and women could sure. fall anywhere. Um, but so, you know, there's this uh, inability of us to, you know, accurately assess our performance. And this leads to women generally expressing lower confidence than men, even though they have comparable performance. And that leads to women being more sensitive to social information. Um, so this was an attempt to kind of like, dig down in, you know, into this kind of this result from social psychology, hybridize it with some cultural evolutionary stuff and, and see if we can understand what's going on. Um, so, I mean, but this still kind of asks, well, what's, why is, why is there then now this uh, difference in confidence between the sexes? And it's, it's not clear. Um, so it does, the task that stereotypically favored men um, showed a bigger confidence difference. So this is suggesting that it is at least culturally mediated, that cultural beliefs about what tasks men and, men and women are good at um, shapes, you know, shapes our confidence and in turn shapes our social learning. Um, but it's also the case that just people have a slightly hard time at assessing our own performance at tasks anyway. You know, unless we're getting loads of direct feedback about, you know, you got that question right, you got this one wrong. It's actually pretty hard to figure out if we're any good at a task, because we just have these kind of gut feelings about how well we're doing. Um, okay, so even this lack of confidence on the part of women, on average, uh, of course, it, it could be influenced by any sort of social learning. For example, they could learn from other people that women perform worse 
on this type of task and that would be the reason why they feel less confident in doing it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm pretty sure that is uh, what's going on in these cases, because obviously, you know, stereotypes are shared cultural phenomenon. You know, we're not inventing them on our own. Uh, you know, we're raised in an environment where people make jokes about, I don't know, like women's spatial awareness or something. And those go on to shape our expectations about how well men and women will do at particular tasks. And I think, to be honest, I think something like confidence is particularly susceptible or suitable to cultural influence because it is this kind of nebulous thing that's hard to really pin down objectively and you know, it's hard to say how confident someone should be. And there's always uncertainty about our confidence or there's always uncertainty about how good we are at a task. And so therefore we you know, will be sensitive to other cues, things like um, stereotypes from our sort of cultural upbringing and they'll shape our confidence and in turn they shape our social learning behaviors. Mm -hmm. but, but there's also where we get into a chicken and egg problem because uh, there's also that critique about, um, about what, for example, Lida Cosmides and John to be called the standard social science model that is based on, on social cultural constructionism or something like that, uh, where people can say, okay, so... Uh, you might say that culture influences because it has this sort of content, it influences how people behave. But why is it the case that people have that sort of culture and not another one? And then we get into human universals and it seems that there are a lot of human universals across uh, virtually all studied human societies and then that's where the discussion gets really tricky because what comes first? Is it that people simply have intuitions about, in this case, how men and women behave and then they transmit this information to other people and eventually it develops, in, it develops into what we call culture? Uh, or is it the case that uh, someone comes up with ideas about how men and women should behave and for some reason or another it, it, yeah, it sticks into other people's minds and it eventually develops into a culture, right? I mean, it's very complicated to, to solve the chicken and egg problem, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so ag again, I think it all depends on how much freedom you're willing to give culture. So... Um, Tubi and Cosmides are, you know, kind of on the sort of the genetic control end of the spectrum. So to them, the fact that, yeah, sure, you know, cultural, uh, the contents of your culture can influence your behavior, but ultimately the contents of your culture reflects the contents of your genes. And so this is all, you know, ultimately all the explanatory power can just get traced back to genes. Um, if you see culture as more uh, sort of independent, able to do it, go off and do its own things, then to explain the contents of culture you'll need both genes, but also knowledge of um, sort of the cultural history of that population. You know, the sort of history of sort of innovations and ideas that have uh, the mechanisms of cultural inheritance, how those ideas might have even sort of tweaked or changed the mechanisms of cultural inheritance, because they themselves, you know, will be subject to like learning and developmental processes. And in, in that case, you don't need, you know, a specific aspect of your behavior might not be readily explicable through genes at all. It might be, uh, have a, you know, most of the explanation might come from the, the cultural history in that case. Um, there's also, so there's some work that's relevant to this by um, a guy called Paul Smoldino, where he looked at um, the sort of the evolution of personality types and his argument is that there is goes to this kind of chicken and egg thing. So in we have this notion of you know different axes of personality variation, you know introversion and extroversion and all that sort of stuff. But lo and behold, these vary cross culturally. So measures of sort of describing people's personalities that work well in the West don't work so well elsewhere in the world. Um, and he sees these differences as arising through a sort of a, 
steady co-evolutionary process whereby we, you know, culturally we start constructing differences. Uh, they start changing how our personalities vary. Those differences then like further entrench these like features of our culture that are driving the personality differences in the first place. And so I think a lot of these times um, when culture and behavior, the, the environment and genetics are interacting, there is going to be no sort of satisfying chicken and egg answer. You know, it's not that one came first and the other followed. There's constant back and forth between them, and they're shaping each other all the time. And um, which is why, in my opinion, to you know, to understand lots of of the interesting aspects of human behavior and human psychology, uh, you need sort of a full account from genes and culture and all sorts of different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the issue I've recently had on the show, Gerard Saucier, that he studies uh, personality psychology, and it seems that that's the issue with the big five. It seems that it is pretty well validated uh, uh, in terms of the weird countries, let's say, the Western countries. But when it comes to other cultures, he told me that uh, it lacks universality mm -hmm. and and the system like the big two that he developed. I I, I can't I can tell what the two traits are about now because I didn't memorize them. But it seems that if we reduce the number of traits, then it gets more universal. But if but even then, because it is based on the lexical hypothesis and on the hypothesis that. Uh, people would create words for the sort of behavioral traits that they would deem to be the most important in themselves and in other people that are part of their society, then that would get expressed both verbally and in a written form in terms of their language, right? And that would have a sort of a biological basis because people would be somehow uh, attuned to look for those sorts of traits in other people as well. But I mean, it could be the case that that hypothesis is not completely true or at least that the sorts of traits that it generates uh, are not universal. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um... I think it's interesting because we know to at least some extent that there is genetic influence on personality. You know, this is from studies of identical twins, that sort of thing, the classic twin studies. We know that genes can influence our personality, yet we also know that um, the sort of dimensions along which personalities vary, that itself varies culturally as well, because like you said, the big five works really well for some populations, but not very well for others. Um, and so this kind of uncomfortable hybrid of is it a you know a genetic evolutionary story or is it a cultural evolutionary story well it seems to be both i think this is going to be entirely typical of most of human behavior and cognition including i would say also the um uh gender differences or sex differences we were talking about before so i mean i don't know of any societies uh large scale or small scale that don't have any sort of division of labor according to sex so we, we can expect sex differences in behavior to, to have an enormous history, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. And so on that basis, it seems very likely that there, there are going to be genetic factors involved as well. And obviously we know that there are uh, genetic sex differences because you know, men tend to be XY, uh, women tend to be XX. But at the same time, it's also, I think, extremely uh, likely that these sex differences are going to be supplemented, distorted, or erased by cultural processes. So, you know, the axis of uh, variation according to sex might look different in the West or in the East and stuff like that. Um, stereotypes about men and women can vary between places as well, and we expect those to feed into our development and affect our behavior as adults. Um, all of this sort of stuff. So, again, it's, it's always this um, complex interplay between genes and culture. Mm -hmm. And because you also study other animals, uh, what are the sorts of information that we can get from other animals in terms of uh, better understanding how certain cognitive mechanisms that go associated with the production of culture, let's say, work uh, 
and where they come from. And I mean, uh, is it the case that maybe we can obtain two different sorts of information that is because there is biological continuity particularly between species that are closely related to us maybe by studying for example chimpanzees or bonobos we can better understand how certain cognitive mechanisms that we share with them and that maybe are behind social transmission of information where they come from and how they work and their basically genetic basis but on the other end we also have phenomena of uh, convergent evolution and maybe we can also understand how by two different species that evolved in two somewhat similar environments or perhaps were exposed to similar evolutionarily relevant problems developed uh, 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 similar solutions to those same problems is that basically are those basically the two approaches that we can have there yeah so i guess before answering this question, I should say that I know, you know although my training is an, in animal behavior, uh, my research, my, my personal research, all focuses on, on humans. But obviously, you know, I keep abreast of the animal literature, so I'll, I'll have a go at um, answering this question. So what you're basically asking is, you know, how can we use comparative studies, you know, studies that look at human behavior and the behavior of animals or our cognition and animal cognition or even comparative genetics, how can we use those studies try and understand um, maybe um, you know which bits of, of human behavior are supporting our uh, culture or which which bits of cognition are required for you know how can we explain the fact that human culture seems so different from all other animals even though that in many ways we know that we're not that different say from chimpanzees um, and there definitely are you know, this is the comparative approach, and people do engage in experiments of exactly this kind in, a, in an attempt to answer exactly that question. So at the behavioral level, um, people have done things, for instance, like uh, giving groups of humans or groups of chimpanzees or other primates, giving them the same task to solve, often a very complicated one, um, and saying, looking to see if uh, different species are differently able to solve it. So for instance, you might expect that a group of human children uh, can perform better at solving some complicated puzzle box than a group of chimpanzees can. And this is often the case. Um, but then you can sort of dig into it and say, well, what about their behavior? What, what are the differences in the behavior of the groups of children and the groups of chimpanzees um, that we might use to explain this difference in their performance in terms of you know how their able to collectively solve problems, basically the kind of mini cultures that are developed in experimental conditions. And people have done exactly this. And you know, this kind of work throws up a ton of hypotheses for these you know, candidates uh, that might explain the difference uh, between humans and chimpanzees. Um, and a lot of this work, so there's a, a great um, project done by a guy called Lewis Dean, um, again at the University of St. Andrews, um, a lot of this work suggests that social factors are important. So um, in his work, uh, Lewis found that um, human children are much more sort of like, they're much more pro-social. They're kinder, more collaborative. They cooperate with each other more. You know, they work together to solve the problem. If one of them's struggling, the others will teach them or help them to do a bit better. Whereas with the chimpanzees, and obviously these were, um, chimpanzees in a facility, so they weren't, you know, wild, free-ranging chimpanzees. But there was much less of that kind of behavior. Chimpanzees typically, uh, at best, tolerated each other, um, but a lot of the time they would try and like drive each other away so they could monopolize the puzzle and, and just try and do it themselves. And that way, they didn't have to share the rewards. They could just, you know, it was a much, much more sort of individually motivated approach. Um, but you know, at the other end, you can also look at sort of comparative genetics, where we can. Uh, try and look at sort of genetic differences that have arisen since the split between humans and chimpanzees and try and say, well, you know, what effect are these genes, if, if, what effect are any are they having on our brains? And like, what does that mean? Uh, just a few years ago, that found that um, 
some of the genetic differences between humans and chimpanzees that were expressed in the brain were associated with much higher levels of plasticity and flexibility in the human brain. So to me at least, but maybe this just reflects my pre-existing opinions, that is consistent with that the human brain evolved to move away from having quite tight genetic control to a model where actually the genes just upped the flexibility of the brain to kind of figure out its own thing to a, a greater extent. And so that might be another part of explaining why um, humans, you know, in our daily lives, why our daily lives are so radically different from that of other species, including our nearest neighbors. Maybe just that our brains have been given almost free license to, you know, figure things out for ourselves. And that gave rise to a culture that's uh, quite independent of genetic change and so can, you know, change really Mm -hmm. So it's basically you're referring to the fact that we as humans <clears throat> have evolved the ability to have uh, higher levels or more uh, behavioral flexibility than any other species that we know about and particularly the ones that are more uh, closely related to us evolutionarily speaking. Yes, uh, I'm going to say that's because that's not, you know, this sort of um, behavioral genetics or, you know, the genetics of the brain is not the focus of my work. So I'm going to hedge my bets and say it's just, you know, that's a theory. Um, but I think in general, we can expect humans to, sh to be much more flexible in their behavior than basically almost any other species. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just one last question. Uh, and since we're also dealing with uh, the differences between humans and other animal species. Uh, do, uh, do we already know what are the ingredients that we need for us to have cum cumulative culture? Because that's also a big difference between us and other species. I mean, there are there isn't any other species that we know about about that also has cumulative culture, right? Yeah, so this is a huge question. Um, so, I mean, there is like some evidence for something that slightly resembles sort of cumulative cultural change in other species, but it's very limited compared to the human case where it seems, you know, open-ended um, and just constant. Um, and so a, a major focus of, of study is, yeah, like what, are the, what do we need to get this cumulative cultural evolution? And obviously, you know, because if you can get cumulative cultural evolution, then culture can take you almost anywhere. And so it can radically change your behavior through sort of developmental, you know, plastic uh, processes. But it can also generate sort of bizarre and extreme selection on your genes and so it can change your genes in quite extreme ways. So it's a really important question. And um, a lot of this is, and I guess this is specifically relevant to my work, becomes a question of our you know contemporary human cognition like what is different about our brains that allows us to engage in it and you know, to produce um cumulative cultural evolution that is you know absent in in the brains of say chimpanzees um and it's it's hard to say so a lot of it um seems to be tied in with just general pro-sociality we're much more tolerant of other individuals than lots of other species um but then other people have argued that there might be specific forms of social learning, like imitation, for instance, that are unique to our species, though others would disagree. They think, you know, imitation is just the expression of a sort of beefed up domain general learning process. Um, and a lot of my work specifically looks at things like teaching and language. Uh, so teaching, although it's sort of just every day for humans, is actually really sparse in other species. Um, and interestingly, it, it seems to be basically absent in chimpanzees or if it is present it's to really really uh, low levels um, but obviously you know teaching acts as a mechanism of high fidelity or effective cultural inheritance you know it's it's teaching is a case where someone knows something and then they actively work to make sure that someone else acquires that information effectively um, because ultimately what one of the things you're going to need is some sort of behavioral or cognitive mechanism that ensures information is reliably passed between individuals. Because information is constantly going to be uh, suffering from errors in transmission, the, the cultural equivalent of mutation. So you need processes to um, beef up cultural inheritance to make sure it can survive that sort of degradation. Um, and language, 
might be, you know, yet another case of this, where um, you know language allows you to express concepts that are hard maybe to observe, or you know hard to express through any other means, and so again, it you know facilitates this cultural inheritance, and so that's a lot of the work I look at is um, you know concerned with those sorts of things. But it's worth saying that you know we, we also know it's not just going to be our brains. Um, so a lot of work has been studying how the how population size, but also population structure, might affect cultural change, and specifically the capacity for cumulative cultural evolution. Because um, you can imagine that um, in a large population, uh, one of the buffers against cultural sort of degradation over time is the fact that the information is shared by loads of people. So even if, say, I make a mistake when I'm learning something and I get it wrong, someone else can correct me at a later living in a really small population uh, you know that might just be it if someone forgets something or makes a mistake then that information is gone for good and there are real world um, ethnographic case studies of this happening where um, sudden population shrinkage uh, leads to quite severe cultural losses around that time that the populations cannot recover easily themselves they have to wait either for contact with other groups or for their own population to you know grow again and then innovation can replace it but it's normally um, through contact with other groups that lost behaviors or technologies are, are reacquired. Um, so we know it's not just uh, what our brains look like, it's also to do with how those brains are connected up to each other in a sort of a larger population. And of course then we can look at this in other species as well and say, well, what do their populations look like? And you know, chimpanzees, they might live in reasonably large groups of uh, or so, or chimpanzees, um, but you know, interactions between troops are typically extremely hostile, uh, and so it is a relatively small world compared to um, you know, compared to human societies, where even in small scale societies, you know, people live in sort of household groups or bands, and they're connected with other groups nearby, often through marriage ties or through you know, sort of cultural affiliation in a larger cultural group, and so the um, the typical population size even at the smaller end for humans is way bigger than in most other species. And that might be a factor as well, just the fact that there's more brains working together to solve the same problems. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we also have to take into account that because we have uh, inter-individual and inter-group variation, maybe there are individuals and groups in general where people uh, can copy for some reason or another with higher fidelity a piece of information or learn better uh, how to um, how to create a tool, for example, and then just by variation between individuals and groups, some of them are more successful than others, and then what they do eventually gets transmitted with higher frequencies than the rest. Yeah, absolutely. So this, say this capacity for high fidelity social transmission, I mean, it had to evolve itself. It didn't just like appear fully fledged overnight. It would have been a, you know, a slow, and probably tedious process of the like steady refinements in it, which may have involved uh, genetic change. I mean, it almost certainly did, uh, but it likely also involved um, cultural changes as well. So, you know, for instance, the development of like formal education systems probably helps cultural transmission. Writing probably helps cultural transmission because now you can store a lot more information. The internet probably helps cultural transmission, you know, all that sort of stuff. But yeah, even going a, a, a long way back in time, cultural norms for cooperation, you know, helping others learn things would have probably, you know, benefited, um, been to the benefit of, of cultural transmission. Um, but yeah, so there probably is this long history by which the fidelity of social transmission steadily increases. Um, but I think you're right to suggest that this was in, this was alongside the evolution of cultures itself, and it may have been driven by it. So you talk about stone tools, this is something that I've you know, worked on in my career. So the idea is that, you know, potentially three million years ago when the earliest known stone tools are around, our ancestors were probably engaging in pretty limited social transmission compared to what we do now. Um, it may have been advanced compared to what chimpanzees do. It's hard to say for sure. Um, but whatever it was, it was probably just enough 
for them to transmit the knowledge of how to make these basic stone tools between each other for the technologies to last. Um, or for at least for them to last a few generations, because the early stone tool record is really spotty and it's consistent, it's at least consistent with the tools being invented and then eventually being forgotten and reinvented and forgotten um, in cycles. But whilst those tools were being made and used, the importance of them to the sort of fitness or success of our ancestors might have generated selection favoring enhancements to the cultural transmission process. And so over time, we would have expected there to be evolutionary change that facilitated the transmission of uh, these tools until they became really reliably transmitted. So they, they weren't dropping in and out, that they were just, you know, a constant. And at that point, um, our ancestors may have been able to come up with new innovations, you know, new kinds of improved stone tools that they themselves now may just be at the limit of what our ancestors could transmit to each other with their new enhanced forms of social transmission. And obviously then now the reliance on these new, more complex stone tools uh, would have um, sort of redoubled the selection on the ability to transmit information more generally. And so you've got this kind of steady back and forth between um, tools or really any kind of cultural product that is demanding for us to learn. You know, it it's places demands on our ability to learn from each other. And, you know, that, that's co-evolving with our ability to learn from each other as well. So it's this constant back and forth that slowly takes our species from something that was, you know, probably looks like it had much more in common with a chimpanzee to something that now, you know, looks unlike almost any other species on the planet. Mm -hmm. And that would basically be a process where a culture would work as a selective pressure and we get into processes of gene culture coevolution. Yeah, here, the contents of our culture, which includes these sort of cultural innovations that are difficult for us to learn from each other, the culture is placing uh, a selection pressure on potentially on genes to sort of, you know, maybe enhance our ability to communicate with each other. But it might also, if you wanted to take a sort of, um, so, you know, I'm a fan of gene culture coevolution, but it's also possible that these, this sort of stuff placed pressure on cultural practices as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, when there's different groups of, you know, human ancestors who are trying to transmit tools to each other, groups that adopt norms of like, of, you know, being kind to the, the young children in the group, you know, spending time with them, showing them how to do things, you know, that might be a cultural innovation that enhanced uh, cultural, you know, cultural transmission as well. So it's, in my opinion, uh, there's going to be change, both cultural and genetic supports cultural inheritance. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, Dr. Morgan, let's end the interview here. But just before we go, would you like to tell people what would be the best places on the internet for them to find your work? Oh, if you want to find my work, you can visit my lab website. It's uh, echolab.org. So that's E-C-C-O-L-A-B.org. And I put all my work up there with links to various collaborators. So you can read more there. Okay, great. So I will be leaving that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Morgan, again, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show and to talk with you. So thank you again for taking the time. Great. Thanks, Ricardo. It's been fun. Hi there, thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Uh, otherwise, I also have a PayPal and Subscribestar. And if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Iane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, and Dr. Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, and Ruth Gervois, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.